What's going on smart people? If you are familiar at all with quantum mechanics, then you know what this equation is. This is the famous Schrodinger equation, the poster child of quantum mechanics. And in your first course in quantum mechanics, your professor at some point will admit to you that this only works at describing particles moving substantially slower than the speed of light. It does not account for relativistic particles, like a really, really fast electron. And when I first heard this, I had a bunch of thoughts going through my head, one of which was, how do you know that? How do you know that this fails to account for relativity? That's actually going to be the main point of this video, but assuming that that's true, assuming that this doesn't describe relativistic particles, fine. My next question was, well, the Schrodinger equation was derived in 1925, published in 1926. At that time, general relativity had been around for 10 years, special relativity for 20 years. So relativity had been around upwards of 20 years, an entire generation of people knowing the dynamics of charged particles. Why would Schrodinger waste his time coming up with a theory of quantum mechanics that doesn't account for it? And the answer is, he tried. Klein and Gordon were not the first people to attempt a relativistic quantum mechanics. Schrodinger beat them to it. He had his version of the Klein-Gordon equation, did all the same things, only described spinless particles, predicted negative energy solutions, failed to properly describe the gyromagnetic ratio of spin and the magnetic moment. And because of all this stuff, he abandoned ship, saw that his non-relativistic quantum mechanics was novel enough to publish, and that's what he did. And less than a year after, the Klein-Gordon equation was published. Less than two years after, the famous Dirac equation was published. So people weren't messing around. So you have to be an absolute mad lad like Paul Dirac to come up with a fully functioning relativistic theory of spin one half particles. I can live with that. But that still begs the question of why doesn't the Schrodinger equation work to describe them in the first place? That is the main topic of today's video. Let's just, let's just jump right into it. Now to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure how the story goes from here. I don't know if like an absolute Chad, Schrodinger started with a relativistic quantum mechanics or if he started non-relativistic, worked his way up kind of stumbled a little bit and just went back to good old non-relativistic. But assuming he wanted to have a fully relativistic equation, this is what would go on in my mind. You have wave-particle duality, which is understood. So if a particle can be a wave, then there should be a wave equation. That's the jumping off point. The second jumping off point is knowing that for relativity, space and time should be on equal footing. So the first asymmetry in this equation comes from the fact that we have a second order spatial derivative here and a first order time derivative here. That is completely different from how a relativistic wave equation like Maxwell's wave equation should look. But you know what, maybe I can give this a pass. A wave equation isn't a wave equation because it's second order in time and space. What makes something a wave equation is a wave solution satisfies it. So that's not a kill shot, but you're on thin ice, mister. However, what is a much larger red flag to me is the fact that the Hamiltonian is constructed from the classical Hamiltonian. At no point do you use Einstein's energy relation, E squared is equal to NC squared squared plus PC squared. Where is this? It is nowhere. A non-relativistic Hamiltonian will give you a non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. Probably. The rest of this video is going to get pretty mathematically intensive, and if that's not your thing, thank you for watching. I hope I was able to convince you with my prior arguments. I need a little bit more than that, but be sure to do all the subscrumblings and all that, but now we're going to get our hands dirty a little bit because I, I need more rigor. I mean, if you can construct tensors from things that aren't tensors, I don't know, maybe you can construct something that's relativistic from things that aren't relativistic. I don't know. The only full way to figure out whether or not this is a relativistic equation is to see if it's left invariant under the Lorentz transform. So that's what we're doing next. And that is exactly why I seemingly wrote the Schrodinger equation twice. If this is truly a relativistic wave equation for quantum mechanics, then if we were to Lorentz transform our x and t into some x prime t prime reference frame, the form of the Schrodinger equation should remain unchanged, just like it is for Maxwell's wave equation. The easy part with getting started in this are our functions. Our functions of x and t are just going to become functions of x prime t prime because we're going to be losing all of that x and t dependence. So that's the easy part. The hard part comes from understanding how to transform these partial derivatives into our primed frame. Uh, but really, it's just chain rule. But there is something cool that I want to show you just because I, I can't let myself not talk about it for a second. But let's go ahead. We want to express d over dx in terms of the primed coordinates. This is just chain rule, right? We're going to use dx prime dx d dx prime plus dt prime dx 
d over dt prime. What's cool about this that I can't help but talk about for just a second is if you think about how the components of a covariant vector transform. If we have some a sub mu, we know that we have some transformation coefficient dx called alpha dx mu a sub alpha. So in a sense, the chain rule is just giving us our transformation coefficients where we're summing over alpha. I always thought that that was pretty cool. I think that's a cool way of connecting the linear algebra to the multivariable calculus. Okay, so we got this. Now let's calculate our transformation coefficients, which we can get from the Lorentz transform right here. So this is equal to dx prime dx. That's just going to give us a factor of gamma times d dx prime. And then we've got dt prime dx. dt prime with respect to x is going to give us a minus gamma v over c squared. So minus gamma v over c squared d over dt prime. Now all we have to do is take the derivative of this again with respect to x to get our second derivative in terms of all of these prime stuff. To make it a little bit more uh, concise, I want to call this entire expression here, we're going to call that f. f is a function of x prime and t prime. Then that tells us that d squared dx squared is equal to df dx, which is equal to, from the chain rule again, it's going to be dx prime dx df dx prime plus dt prime dx df dt prime. We already know what these transformation coefficients are. This is just going to give us a factor of gamma df dx prime. We already know what this is. That's going to give us a minus gamma v over c squared. Minus gamma v over c squared df dt prime. Now it gets a little bit monotonous because now we have to take the derivatives of this with respect to x prime and t prime, but it's, it's not hard. It's just a little tedious. So this is equal to uh, gamma times d dx prime of this. So we've got the, this is a constant, so the derivative is blind to this and just attach this partial derivative. So it gives us a gamma d squared dx prime squared. And then we've got uh, minus gamma blind to the constant again, d squared dx prime dt prime. The order of the partial derivatives does not matter. And now let's go ahead and do that for this term. So we get a minus gamma v over c squared df dt. Again, so we got our gamma d over dx prime dt prime. And then we have uh, minus gamma v over c squared d squared over dt squared. So this is our definition, or this is how our transformation works. This is exactly what our second derivative with respect to x squared is. Okay, let's go ahead and do some cancellations. So everything here is going to have a factor of gamma squared. So let's just go ahead and factor that out. So that's gamma squared, d squared, dx squared. And we're getting this one out of the way because the time derivative is first order. So this is equal to gamma squared. Now this is alone, so this is a d squared dx prime squared. We've got a minus v, we got a uh, yeah, minus v over c squared here, and then we've got a uh, a minus a minus v over c squared here, so that gives us a minus two v over c squared d squared dx prime dt prime. And then finally, we have a minus and minus, which is a plus. So that's going to give us a v squared, because these are multiplied over c to the fourth. So plus v squared over c to the fourth d squared dt prime squared. Forgot my prime here. Okay. That's it.
That's what this second derivative is. The rest is really simple from here. The last thing to do is to find out what this time derivative is. We're gonna go through the exact same motions except for we don't have to do it twice, which is gonna be quite a time saver. And things are already going painfully wrong, which is a good sign because we have this cross term here and we have the second derivative of time now. This thing really wants to be a wave equation and it's just, it's just not gonna happen, spoiler alert. So let's go ahead and find out what this DDT is using the same method. So we've got our derivative with respect to time is equal to, we've got our chain rule, so we got dx prime dt, d over dx prime, plus dt prime dt, d over d uh, t prime. Let's calculate our transformation coefficients. This is just gonna be dx prime dt is gonna give us a minus v gamma, I'll call it minus gamma v, d over dx prime, dt prime dt is gonna give us a factor of gamma, so plus gamma d over dt prime, great. So now all we have to do is substitute in our second derivative and our first derivative into the Schrodinger equation and see if we recover this Lorentz invariant quantity or if things just continue to go wrong. We'll write our h bar squared over 2m uh, and then our second derivative got a gamma squared, and all this mess, minus 2v over c squared, d squared over x prime, t prime, plus v squared over c to the fourth. You guys get the idea that this stuff depends on x prime and t prime, so I'm not going to write it for the potential. That's just going to take up too much space. Plus v and psi is equal to i h bar. We've got a common factor of gamma here. Then I'll write the positive term first. d over dt prime minus v d over dx prime, all acting on psi of x prime and t prime. And that's it, that is our transformed Schrodinger equation. There's really nothing we can do here. We can cancel one factor of gamma, but there's no way of getting rid of this mixed term. There's no way of getting rid of the second derivative. We have our second order uh, spatial and our first order time, which is good, but we also have that first order space. It's just, it's not working out. This is foolproof that the Schrodinger equation is just not a relativistic quantum mechanical equation. Okay, I don't think any of us are particularly surprised there with the Schrodinger equation not being very relativistic, but not all hope is lost. In a previous video linked in the description, I derived the Klein-Gordon equation. What I want you to do for homework is using the same method, tell me whether or not the Klein-Gordon equation is invariant under Lorentz transformation. Send your work and your answer to smartpeopleask at gmail.com. The first person to give me a correct response, I will post your work and your name on tomorrow's video and any message you would like to say, assuming it's not terribly offensive. So I look forward to seeing all of your guys' work. I'll see you guys there.